this cabin sole was put down in 1984, which makes it 40 years old. It doesn't look bad. And every two years I've put two more coats of Schooner High Gloss varnish on it. But finally, discoloration is occurring from water incursion. It has one irredeemable problem and that is it's getting a bit soft underfoot. The design of any cabin sole on a sailboat, sole just means the floor, is a challenge. And in this case, the Ericsson Yacht Company met the challenge with complication. This is Teak and Holly laminate plywood, which is screwed down to hold it to the substructure. And then the screws are plugged and the entire edge is made up of trim pieces also screwed and plugged. The forward pieces were delaminated when I got the boat. I took them out and was able to save them by introducing some laminating epoxy and then reinstalling them. But the rest of it, all of it, alas, has to go. So there's going to be some sailing, right? It's a maintenance video. Yeah, but I mean, we're going sailing. Maintenance is part of sailing, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not sailing. We need to put in a new cabin floor first, and then we'll go sailing. Well, all right. Wet, but not rotten. Four down, 30 to go. And if you ask yourself why anybody would go to all this trouble of carefully digging out these trim pieces, 34 of them. It's simply because making all new trim pieces is a really unattractive prospect. Really. Down here with a miter saw. Wow. So with the trim removed, the next question is, how did Ericsson Yachts build this uh, cabin sole. It has some eccentricities. For one thing, the hull rises here, so they apparently cut the plywood there on both sides to accommodate the hull shape. And the other question is, how many pieces is this part of the sole, which has a, which ends here, because plywood comes in four by eight sheets and this is the maximum amount of space, about 39 inches, that we have to fit something through. So, I'm very curious to see where Ericsson made the joints. And will we be able to get it out in one piece for a pattern, or will it disintegrate in our hands? No sailing yet. Patience. This job took 39 days. Oh, and you didn't even start yet. Yes, we did. Wow. Yep. I would say that's delaminated. Gosh, it stinks too. And this is the, the structure of the Ericsson grid, the fiberglass grid that holds the furniture and and is tabbed to the hull, and they catch water. I don't know how many thousand years this water's been there, but um, that's clearly what ruins the bottom of a sole.
Well, good as new, I think we can reuse this piece again. Oh. These are the pieces that I fixed two years ago now. But I think that possibly the statute of limitations repairing stuff has run out. The pattern of my ragged old half destroyed floorboard that I used to make this initial pattern was uh, so beat up that the me some of the measurements were guesswork. I guess in this case we'll just go down a little bit here. I have seen this strip bath and I thought I would try it for this last piece. These templates are easy to make and they can be very accurate. Then it's just an easy matter to uh, use the pattern to cut the plywood. Sure it's a nice day but who wants to go sailing anyway? I took this opportunity to paint the bilge that's visible when the floorboards are in place. Just, it's good to have a, it's good to have a clean white bilge so you can see at a glance uh, what's in there. That's all. The trim was drilled for bungs, but I want to use bronze screws that are countersunk, so that means filling the old bung holes. Bungs are just wooden plugs that hide screw heads, and I'll still need a few of them. Making them is fun. They pop satisfyingly out of their motherboard. These pieces that go around corners, as it were, got special treatment. Just tried to use thickened epoxy to fill the gaps and maybe make a serviceable turn out of it, and I don't know if it's going to work. You know, the difference between an, a professional at this sort of thing and me and any amateur is that an amateur does everything for the first time. So my concerns are just trying to do as good a job as I can. You know, Arthur Miller, America's foremost playwright, I suppose, Death of a Salesman and all of that, and married Marilyn Monroe, if you don't mind, was a woodworker. Somewhere out there, there's a documentary that shows him in his shop. I was struck immediately by what really sloppy work there was at his workbench. And it made me doubt that writers were any good at this at all. So let's just say that my hope for this whole project is that I'm better at it than Arthur Miller was. And now, to perfect the patterns, I can bring that in a little closer, I think. Just so the trim covers it, that's all. Well, that's the plan, anyway, to fix whatever flaws there were in the temporary floorboards. Get some register marks and uh, perfect the cutouts. Now pull them all up and take them home and see if we can ruin some really expensive plywood. Three quarter of an inch teak and holly plywood is hard to source in California at the moment. I found it for $900 a sheet in Florida, $1,000 more to ship. I found two sheets in Michigan, but I needed three. So one half inch has to do. 
at $375 a sheet in San Diego. I had to pick it up myself, 150 miles on top of the car. Well, here's an opportunity to fill everything up. This pattern has to line up with that one. And if it doesn't, then the holly lines will be crooked. So I think if that's the case, and these are lined up, then the pattern can go anywhere it wants to within reason. If I had mechanical drawing in high school, I did very well, but actually I didn't want to take mechanical drawing. I wanted shop, but they said, well, son, Mr. Williams, despite your terrible grades, you're in the classical college bound track and we don't offer shop to people who are going to college because they won't need it. Really? This was the world in 1957. Are you kidding me? It's California, but we have parrots and they're very annoying. Be quiet up there. So here's a good test of this guide. We, I need to trim this so that just the white, the uh, so-called holly is showing so it mates with the other piece. And this should give confidence in getting that just right. We will see. Just about perfect. Hmm. Same deal, I've got to remember to get these pieces lined up where we're going to have a zebra with mighty unusual stripes. Well, that's the last of the cutouts of the templates. We're faced now with making a square hole in a piece of plywood, which is not so easy. And this will be my straight edge for trying to guide the jigsaw. As I have learned, jigsaw cuts are not so easy to do in a perfectly straight line, which is what we want, because it'll be faced with a piece of teak, mitered teak. Now, that is a long way from straight. We'll have to touch it up with sandpaper. Now, comes the adventure of making these inspection hatches for the bilge, which were built by the Ericsson Yacht Company in the early 1980s. I noticed that Ericsson went to the effort of screwing these on, probably gluing them, screwing them on, and plugging them. They must have done that because they expected to have to plane these to fit, which I also expect to have to do. But the question then becomes how to attach these to what's going to be matching Teak and Holly plywood squares, and I considered clamping them, but clamping epoxy is, is slippery and they fall out of true, which won't be good. So I think I will use another method of temporarily nailing them. Can't get any epoxy on the laminate because you can't sand it. The recommendation is to wet it out with epoxy and then to add some thickener. The tape is there to catch some of the squeeze out. I can already feel this epoxy warming up so it needs to... I'm going to get it in a more shallow container. Now we can thicken it up a little bit with some sawdust, basically. Huh. 
Two fittings. My world's record. Pretty Rube Goldberg. There are lots of different ways carpenters do this. Uh, and I wish I had invested in one of those straps that has four corners on it. And you just tighten it up and it pulls everything together. So I did invest in one of those gizmos and the investment was $10, I think. Quite a clever device. Uh, it's adjustable and fine by these, this uh, screw. I don't see why that isn't pretty good. We don't need a lot of pressure. I want to squeeze all the epoxy out. I wanted to save the old mast surrounds um, because they're made of teak. But getting them off the old uh, lids, not so easy because they've been, uh, the, uh, these are bronze screws, they've been epoxied in. So I'm reduced to, to uh, bashing them open uh, to retrieve this uh, antique looking surround. The only method I could come up with was to just physically uh, remove the material around the screws and then yank them out with a vice grip. You know, when you have a contractor come to your house, you say, why don't we just fix up what we've got here? He says, sir, it's much easier to tear everything down and start from scratch. And this is a classic example of that. I'm about one hour now into saving these two small trim pieces. Well, here are the main pieces put together for the first time. I intentionally made the trim pieces on the patch lids a, a little bit uh, proud of their fit because I didn't know, I didn't want to go too small. And now, of course, they'll have to be trimmed down and I don't know quite how to do that. Probably a plane. And I have to make sure that I, I plane both sides so that the Teak lines continue to line up, and if they don't, then I screwed up. No, I guess the moral of the story is don't drop things. Glue. It's an antique, but I think I'll reuse it. I have had an epiphany. In fact, two epiphanies and a haircut. The first epiphany is that rapid code 
Varnish is pronounced epiphanes, not epiphany. And the second epiphany is that when I coated these pieces with clear penetrating epoxy sealant, I then, two days later, when it was still slightly tacky, coated it with varnish. And it has now been six days before the tackiness is gone enough so I can put another coat on. And I concluded something from this. Veneer plywood is very hard. The CPS simply does not absorb into this hard surface. Certainly the edges of plywood is, is always ready to absorb uh, materials, especially water, where it can rot. And I'm sure CPS would work just fine on that. My conclusion is that it was a mistake to put even one coat of CPS on the veneer because it just sat there and pooled and took six days to cure. So, as usual, one size doesn't fit all. I thought I would start the varnish stage with the bottoms and this uh, Epiphany's rapid coat. which is a fast drying varnish, rolling and tipping. I learned a long time ago that for flat surfaces on varnish, the heresy of a roller actually works quite well. The key to these big flat surfaces when varnishing is not to leave a holiday a gap in which, since it's high gloss, fails spectacularly to reflect light later on. So by going in two directions with a roller, you can pretty much eliminate brush strokes, gaps, which are hard to see, especially in low light. You put it on and it makes, of course, a million bubbles which are solved with a few quick strokes of a badger hair brush. And it's important to be able to see not just what you're doing, but harsh reflections which reveal any gaps in the coverage. Well, here's an issue that's hard to ignore. Somehow I managed to pick up lumps of varnish in the finish, I think one coat ago. How could that happen? My best guess is that I didn't clean the brush adequately. I got up a lot of trouble, four washes in acetone and then brushing it out with a stainless steel brush to get the lumps out. But something went wrong. It might just be that the cans really makes good spaghetti sauce that the cans I've been using to clean the brushes perhaps have an inner liner that the acetone dissolves because I see a bunch of lumps in there. So that's it for cans. Looks like I better sand all that off. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's more like it. I don't want to get any glops on there at this stage. Oh sure, throw in some old footage with pretty music, but this isn't sailing. I'm inclined to agree. You've been in a garage for two weeks. I'm inclined to agree, but winter's the right time to do these projects. Yeah, but it's not a sailing video. A point well taken.
Well, now. Oh, pretty. How many coats of varnish is this? Five. We'll put another couple on when we get to the boat. Hey, thanks for helping me with this. It's just going to be easier to pass the stuff around. No, you need me. I'm strong like bull. Third one. And then there's two triangles. Good. This, I think the other end has to go in first because we have to maneuver it. It's too big for the hole. Yeah, that way. And then you have to go pretty much vertical. So you have to step up on the cockpit seat and we have to figure out a way to make this physics work if this comes out right it will be a miracle Satisfying crunch. A little has to come off here so that these lines match up, but not much. Boy, that's kind of a relief all yeah, in all. Great. The stuff fits well enough because the trim pieces solve all the problems. Nobody will ever notice that that is three-eighths of an inch of a gap because the former floorboards were thicker. It's gorgeous. I mean, I know it's got some work to go, but you would never know it from looking at it. It's really beautiful. One thing I forgot to do was to bevel this piece. So, let's bevel it. Yep, kind of a shock, all right. Last night, 11.30, the club burned down. You might call it a coastal catastrophe. The epicenter of the historic California Yacht Club went up in flames late Monday night. Apparently it started in the kitchen. I don't think they know for sure yet, but it sure is a sad sight. But they'll rebuild it. At least none of the boats were injured. Now time to screw the floorboards down, which is a tedious business. These are the screws that you can see in the middle of the boards. And they, since nobody wants to see screws, will be plugged, meaning a bung will be inserted later to hide the depressed screw head. And that depression is made by a drill with a plug countersink and an adjustable collar. We're screwing into one inch thick fiberglass layup, which is brutal even on stainless steel screws. I'm using screw lube. You know, I toyed with the idea of gluing all this down, not using so many screws, but the prospect of spreading uh, construction adhesive all over this boat and then trying to lower each board into place and get it just right sounded in the end like an enormous mess waiting to happen. <laughs> so I guess what's good for Ericsson will have to be good for me.
and this is just the first pass because the next step is screwing the periphery down all the way around every board and subsequent to that will go the trim pieces which also get screwed down but first things first This is Pat Senator, the Pat Senator Trio. All the things you are, and Pat now living in your. Now we can start screwing down the edges of the boards, and what I've done is to set up the trim pieces so that I don't accidentally put a screw in under right where the preordained screw holes are going to be in the trim. <laughs> I have been counting the screws as I put them in, and I think there are 1,319,000 screws in this boat, and I have put in 966,000 of them so far, so we're making a lot of progress. The trim pieces I'm putting on with bronze slotted head screws, which I thought would give an old-timey nautical look and which may or may not be worth the trouble because slotted head screws, old-fashioned as they are, are not as easy to grip Oh, I see there's no trim piece on the top. You know, the previous filler piece for this, the triangle, was carved out of a block of solid teak. So this will have to do. It ought to fit right in there. I can use some construction adhesive to firm it up. And I've had to modify this collar because I couldn't get the wire uh, to fit without it, but that's easy enough. And there are some other funky parts, including this cover, which I'm going to have to relieve the back of it because the boat's not exactly flat uh, behind the base of the mast because of the mast step. I doubt this is enough, but... Try it before we make another pass. And we'll need some plugs or bunks, about 50.
I think this is considered a finishing touch. Filling the bung holes with bungs. They're just held in with a dab of varnish. And it helps to get the grain lined up. Of course, without daylight saving time, the world is going dark. Well, at least it's light. Chisel. The trick is to nick them down without breaking them below deck level which is pretty easy to do. And then they get sanded. that that sort of takes the surface down to the next step which is uh, another good vacuuming and some a wipe down with mineral spirits maybe to get the last remaining dust off this is a varnish I like schooner from an airlocks it's really an old-fashioned varnish <laughs> and I think the next time I sand anything it'll be wearing a dust mask <coughs> Some planning is required so as to not paint oneself into the proverbial corner. Often you want to slow down the drying of the varnish so that it can level. To let it cure slowly enough so that the gravity dissipates the, the bubbles. only peace of mind possible with varnishing is that if you don't like the way it comes out you can always do it over how long can you hold your breath because that's what this feels like Varnish coat number one, for better or worse. Well, not bad. Not perfect, but not bad. I think we'll just, for the final coat, we'll just smooth things out a little bit with some more 220. There are, there are some bubbles in it and this time we'll add a little bit of thinner to the varnish to make it easier and that ought to be it second coat came out fine thinning the varnish a little bit did help I think so now there are seven coats on here in total and there'll be more over the years this job took 40 days and about 120 hours of labor and it's a fair question why anybody would want to do it himself well, the answer for me is that you learn stuff. You learn the mysteries of varnish and wood and tools and epoxy. Why, it's like a ship in the bottle. You know, if you haven't built a ship in the bottle, you don't realize that the masts 
go in through the mouth of the bottle lying down and then a secret string is pulled which makes the impossible possible. Not that there weren't days during this project when I thought it was impossible and perhaps would never end. But all's well that ends well. And I know we never got to go sailing, so to make up for it, here's 40 minutes worth. And our captain is Thelonious Monk.